morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. I think for me and all of the speakers, we're on the west coast of the US, so it's evening for us. Um, I'm Justin Haldar from the University of Southern California, and uh, this is the session on image reconstruction. Uh, we, we've got uh, three very interesting talks lined up for us for the, the first hour. Um, and, and so to just keep things moving along, let, let's get into those talks. So the, the first talk will be by Efra Chimran on subtle data crimes. Uh, remember, as we're going through these talks, if you have questions, feel free to enter those into the Q&A or into the chat. And there will be a few minutes at the end of each talk for us to ask speakers some of those questions. All right, so Efra, please go ahead. Thank you, Justin. So let me share the screen. <clears throat> All right, can you see it? Yep. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. And today I'll talk about our research on solid data crimes, which shows when naively training machine learning algorithms could lead to overly optimistic results. Uh, this is my disclosure. Our lab receives research support from GE Healthcare. So MRI reconstruction algorithms are often evaluated in retrospective experiments, as I'm sure that you know. Uh, this is the general uh, structure of a, a retrospective experiment, and such experiments often rely on fully sampled case-based data. The data are subsampled using a, a variable density mask or a different mask, and the result of a reconstruction algorithm is quantified by comparing it with a gold standard image using error metrics such as the normalized root mean square error. Now, uh, such experiments assume that the fully sampled case-based data are raw data and that they are obtained from an MRI scanner. But today, in the deep learning era, thousands of examples are needed for training uh, deep learning models. And therefore, it is more common that people download MR images, not case-based data, but images from online databases, and they apply the forward discrete Fourier transform to these images to get the fully sampled case-based data. But uh, when we reviewed papers, we noted that this common practice is highly problematic because the images that are stored in online databases are often prepared using hidden data processing pipelines. Now, the reason for this is that there are many databases out there, and some of them are, uh, offer images for post-reconstruction tasks, such as classification, segmentation, and biomarker discovery. There are some databases that do offer raw MRI data, but this all seems very confusing because there are many, many databases out there and people not always know what to, exactly to choose. And so today people do this kind of uh, mix and match thing where they find some data that was published somewhere, they download it, and they apply the forward for transform to get case space and they base their experiments on such case based data. But uh, we noticed that uh, this is problematic because the data that are offered for post reconstruction reconstruction tasks are pre processed. And the pre-processing changes, changes the data features, it improves the condition of the inverse problem, and eventually this leads to biased, overly optimistic results. And the aim of this research is to highlight this uh, phenomenon. Because people are not aware of this phenomenon, sometimes such optimistic results are published uh, without uh, accounting for the pre-processing. And um, this leads to confusing a uh, confusion in our research field. So to raise awareness to this problem, we coined the term subtle data crimes, which refers to the publication of algorithmic results obtained for pre-processed data, where the pre-processing is not reported or not addressed. We also use the term off-label usage, which means taking data that was published for one, one task and using it for a different task. And now today I will describe uh, two very common pre-processing pipelines. The first one is a pipeline that is implemented inside commercial MRI scanners. So let's dive into the details of this pipeline. In a, a commercial scanner acquires a data, acquires, of course, raw case based data, often using a multi coil array, and then it applies zero padding. Now, this is often done by, by default inside commercial scanners of all major vendors, uh, Philips, GE, Siemens, and so on. Then the images are transformed to the image domain. And finally, they are combined using a, a, a method such as root sum of scores. And they are combined into a single magnitude image. This, this image is not only real valued, but it is also interpolated due to the zero padding. Uh, this image is the output of the scanner. And this image is uh, stored in an online database for later purposes. 
However, at some later time point, somebody comes and takes it and applies the forward for transform to get case space. And here you can see examples for case space data that we found in the wild in online databases, and they show evidence for zero padding. You can see it here. Now, in this case, it's okay because the data were proposed for post reconstruction -reconstru -reconstru tasks, such as a biomarker extraction. But for our aim, this inserts bias. Uh, nevertheless, many people are not aware of that. Therefore, they download the database, they apply the, the forward for a transform. And now look what happens. The case space data that were previously empty here in these areas are now full. Artificial data appears here due to the combined effect of all of this pipeline. But because you know, this data is completely artificial, but because people are not aware of this phenomenon, they apply a variable density subsampling mask to the entire case space area. The problem is that variable density masks, which are very co commonly used these days, the problem is that they sample the center of case space much more densely than its periphery, but the original data are also located in the center of case space. So as a result, the original data, the true data, are being sampled with a much higher rate than the rate that is planned for the entire case space. To show this, I did the following experiment. In this experiment, I generated nine subsampling masks for three different case space sizes and three different undersampling schemes. So here on the top, you see the case space size. This is non-padded case space, two-fold zero-padded and three-fold zero-padded. And here you see the three subsampling schemes, random uniform, weak variable density, and strong variable density. Now, all these mask contain, masks contain exactly 17% sampling. Then I measured the effective sampling rate, which is the sampling rate only for the original non-padded case space area, which is shown here in yellow boxes. And then I plotted this rate versus the zero padding uh, ratio. So as you can see, although all these mask, masks contain exactly 17% sampling, the effective rate, the sampling rate for the real data can be as high as 40 and even 55%. Now, any algorithm is likely to perform very well when it is given access to 55% of the original data, especially considering the fact that the images are magnitude only. And as you probably know, magnitude images have conjugate symmetry in case space. So it is sufficient to sample 50% of case space in order to fully reconstruct the image. So if an algorithm is given access to, let's say, 40%, well, while all it needs is 50%, then the algorithm will produce fantastic results. But people are not aware of this, and therefore they publish excellent results, and they say that the undersampling factor was R equals six, when in fact it was more similar to two. And uh, therefore, we are, uh, the, the aim of this work is to raise awareness to this phenomenon. And now another thing that I want you to uh, notice is that if you take MR images from a scanner, even uh, the scanner in your own, your own institution, sorry, then this is the default case because MRI scanners apply two-fold zero padding by, uh, by default. So if you take your own images from your scanner and you use the forward full transform, you're already in this scenario. So this is something to keep in mind uh, for later studies. And now in order to show the effect of this increased uh, effective sampling, I did a very large scale set of experiments. Uh, I took data from the FastMRI database. Uh, this database offers raw data. And I uh, simulated the hidden processing pipelines by applying controlled data processing steps. And then I tried and tested three algorithms, compressed sensing, dictionary learning, and deep learning, MODL in this case. So these are very well-known algorithms. Uh, and I tested them and tested their performance versus the data processing uh, uh, extent. And uh, this research uh, required extensive computations. The compute time was two months on 12 GPUs and 200 CPUs. So let's look at some results. So here in these graphs, you see the statistical uh, evaluation of the performance of the algorithms for the test set. Uh, on the top row, you see the NRMSC metric. And on the bottom row, you see the SSI metric. And as you can see, all these algorithms show the same phenomenon. The error reduces artificially with the zero padding. The x-axis is the zero padding. You see this artificial reduction for compressed sensing, for dictionary learning, and for deep learning. So this is the bias that we're talking about. If you train your deep neural network, and you train, if you take it and you train it on a zero data that was zero padded, then you already get an, a, a significant reduction in your error metric for, by almost 40%. Now, people could publish such a fantastic results and say that this is due to a, a, you know, a new architecture or a new loss function or uh, things like that. 
Well, in fact, this is really more due to the data preprocessing. You can see the bias is very, very significant here. And you see it for all the three algorithms. And if you look in the at the bottom row, you see the complementary metric, which should be one for perfect reconstruction. And you see that the SSM rises artificially with the zero padding extent for all the algorithms. Now let's look at a different example. This is a, 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 another example from the FastMRI database uh, for fat saturated data. And here, uh, the networks were trained on such data and tested with this image, which, which contains the pathology. You can see the ground truth of the pathology here on the top. And now let's look at the results. So on the left column, you see the results, the construction results in a correct scenario when there was no data processing. And you see that the pathology is, is quite blurred and it's hard to see it. You see that for all three algorithms. But in the cell data crime case, where the same algorithms were trained and tested on processed data, the same data, then you see that the pathology becomes much sharper. And this is again due to the combined effect of the early uh, data process, the uh, data zero padding, and the later retrospective subsampling using a variable density mask. So uh, this shows us the training algorithm, algorithms using processed data leads to overly optimistic results, uh, uh, even for pathology cases. Okay, so now let's uh, look at a different pipeline, which is also very common uh, for databases that are stored online. And uh, as you know, databases have uh, require uh, a lot of memory storage uh, for storage, and therefore it is common to apply the JPEG algorithm for reducing the memory footprint. So in this pipeline, the images are JPEG compressed before they are stored in an online database. And then at some later time point, somebody comes and downloads these images and apply, applies the forward for a transform and uh, does the same reconstruction experiment. Now, what's the problem with this scenario? The problem is that modern algorithms, uh, compressed sensing, dictionary learning, deep learning, all of them, they use sparsity priors. But the JPEG algorithm also uses sparsity. And in fact, it applies sparsity to the images. It, it saves only a sum of the components in, a, in a, the discrete cosine tra a transform domain. So the, if the JPEG algorithm already sparsifies the data for us, then algorithms that assume sparsity are likely to perform very, very well. Because a lot of the job was already done in the early preprocessing before the database was even stored. And so here we aim to show the training and testing algorithms on JPEG compressed data, again, leads to biased results in terms of bias of, of the final error metric. So let's look at some results. And uh, here you see examples, uh, for, again, from the FastMRI database. On the top row, you see gold standard images that were uh, here on this column, they were not compressed. And here they were compressed using three different JPEG levels. Uh, the quality factor determines the JPEG compression level. Uh, this image was obtained from the default compression factor, which is 75. And these are two examples for lossy compression. And on the bottom row, you see the deep learning reconstructions. Now, if we go from left to right, then you can see that the visual image quality degrades. We see that for the cold standard image. And this is what we expect from a, a, a compression algorithm, right? The more we compress the image, the more artifacts it will show. And you can see the blurring here. Uh, the same phenomenon occurs for the deep learning reconstruction. The images become more blurred, and they have more artifacts as the compression grows from left to right. But look at the error metric. The error metric reduces with the compression level. So this NLMSC actually says that this image is better than this image. Now, why is that? Think about it. Why does the error metric say that this image is better than this image when we can clearly tell that this image is more blurred? I'm gonna give you the answer. Let me go back to the previous slide. The reason is that the error metric measures the distance between the reconstructed image and the gold standard image. But both of these images are based on the same processed data. The error metric cannot measure the difference between the reconstructed image and the original image because the original image was not stored in the database. We don't have access to it. So because all this pipeline is based on processed data, the error metric becomes blind to the preprocessing. It cannot be aware of that because it doesn't have access to the original data. And that is exactly what we see here. And now look at this case. This is the most interesting case. Our, our eyes, the human eye, cannot tell the difference between these two images. These are very, very good reconstructions, right? But the error metric already says that this image is 30% better than this image. 
because apparently our metrics are very sensitive to slight uh, changes that we cannot see. So if you're training and testing your algorithms or JPEG images with the default compression parameter, then you're already in this case. Your results have already been improved by, by 30%, only due to the JPEG compression. So to summarize this slide, we see that uh, when both the reconstruction and the ground truth images are based on process data, the error metrics become blind to the data processing. And now let's look at some statistical results. So here on the left, you see the error metric and uh, on the y-axis and uh, the x-axis shows the JPEG compression, which is the data processing extent. And again, you see the same phenomenon. You see that all these algorithms exhibit a reduction, an artificial reduction of the error metric with the data processing. You see that for compressed sensing, for dictionary learning, and for deep learning. And again, you see that training and testing our models on a processed data can lead to very, very significant bias. Look at that, up to 48% artificial improvement. And we see that for all the, uh, all the, in all the experiments that we did. So next, after we establish the fact that uh, there is bias when we train and test models on processed data, we became interested in the question of what happens when the networks, that, uh, when networks that were trained on processed data are now tested on real-world data, non-processed data. So to try to estimate that, I took networks that were trained on processed data and I tested them twice using processed and non-processed versions of the same underlying test set, the same database. And here you see, uh, this is the same scenario that we have seen uh, up until now. The networks were trained and tested on processed data, and you see that the reconstructions are very good. I hope that you can see that over Zoom. Uh, the, the fine details here are quite clear. But when the same networks are then tested on non-processed data, then the reconstructions are less good. The details are much more blurred, and it is hard to uh, distinguish them, as you can see here. And uh, this graph on the right shows a statistical analysis of the same experiment. The green bars show testing on processed data, and the red bars show the testing on non-processed data. So if we look at the green bars, you see that the errors are very low. This is the bias that we, uh, we saw in all the previous slides. This is the data crime scenario where uh, networks produce very low errors. But if the same networks are trained on real-world data, you see that the error is much higher, almost twice as high. So this shows us the training networks on processed data, but then applying them to real world data can be potentially harmful, right? The errors will be much higher, much, much higher. And we may not be able to estimate it if we don't have ground truth data in the real world scenario. So this is a, another thing to keep in mind. So to summarize this research, uh, uh, we've shown, uh, we've, we show here that naive usage of big data for training MRI reconstruction algorithm can often lead to overly optimistic results. And this research also shows that compressed sensing, dictionary learning, and deep learning are all vulnerable to this bias. Then this is a, a new sensitivity uh, that we uh, discover for these algorithms. And it also shows that off-label data usage could lead to poor results on real-world data. So uh, we also offer some guidelines. Uh, well, what can you take away from this? What, what, what would you do with your own research? So ideally, MRI reconstruction algorithms should be evaluated using raw data, but raw data are not always available, right? Not every application has uh, its own uh, raw database out there. So what can we do when raw data are not available and we have to try and test our models using synthesized data or processed data? So first, you can check if case space was zero pattern. If it was, then you can crop. So you can look at this uh, figure here, for example. If you see this pattern of a square within a square, then the data was zero pattern, and you can crop to the size of the inner square. And then you already solved a, a big part of the problem. Not everything, but you addressed it. Secondly, you can try and estimate the bias, uh, like we did in the experiments here. And finally, you can also try and estimate the performance gaps with, between uh, applying the trend mo uh, models to processed and non-processed data, like we did in this experiment. And anyway, in all cases, data preparation pipelines should be fully disclosed, and transparency should be required by readers and reviewers. So if you are reviewers for journal papers, then please, please ask your authors and ask your readers to, uh, to include full disclosure of every data preparation pipeline and also to go to the websites of the databases that they use and examine carefully if the data have been preprocessed. Because if they were, then this could affect the results. And people are not aware of that. 
And of course, uh, reproducible research should be encouraged. And I think that uh, this conference is doing a wonderful job in uh, uh, enhancing reproducible research in our community. Uh, so to summarize, and I will take questions right after that, our aim with this research is to raise awareness to naive off-label usage of open data. There are wonderful databases out there, but not every database is suitable for every task. So hopefully keep it in mind. And if you're interested in more details about this work, uh, then our archive paper is available here and uh, our Git repository, which was just published a couple of days ago, is, is available here. And you're welcome to experiment with all these data sets. And I would like to take a very uh, short moment to thank my co-authors, uh, John Tamir from the University of Texas at Austin, Kerr Wang from our lab and my advisor, uh, Professor Mickey Rusty. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer questions. You can see that there are some questions uh, in the chat. Maybe not. So, so thanks for the very nice presentation. A uh, reminder to the people in the audience, if you have questions for this speaker or, or for any of the speakers in, in the session, please put those into the Q&A uh, box or into the chat box. We, we can take questions from both of those. Looks like we don't have anything uh, for, for you at the moment, but, but let me just uh, say that this is a really important issue. Um, so, so I'm an associate editor for the IEEE transactions on medical imaging. I'm a senior area editor for the IEEE transactions on computational imaging. And I know that my friends over at Magnetic Resonance and Medicine who are deputy editors face the same issues. Uh, and, and we end up rejecting a lot of papers uh, without even sending them out for review because of issues like this. Um, and, and so the more the community is aware that this is a problem, the, the better it is for everyone. 